Uh, I could stay here all night and listen to that. We are committed to uh, going into some overtime uh, because our next speaker has such a timely topic. Uh, he is the Associate General Counsel with Florida Realtors. He also brings experience uh, in, as a litigator and with four years in state government in Tallahassee, his topic, copyright and generative AI, or how I learned to stop worrying and love chat GBT. Ladies and gentlemen, Rich Swank. Thank you, Jeff. And, all right, so I know I'm in the last thing between you and happy hour, so I will try to make this quick. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to cut all of my pickleball-related content. So, you know, I, but I, I know that was, uh, that was something you were looking forward to. So, uh, copyright and generative AI, all right? It's a hot topic. I first gave this uh, talk in January. Um, and I think it was 10 minutes. Now I can do well over an hour. You guys only get half an hour. Um, but things are changing so fast that literally I've had multiple changes to the slides that I gave these folks last week. So um, now what is generative AI? All right, I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and read that. All right, read that, that lar long thing. The thing to remember is that AI is not new. Artificial intelligence was first used at a computer conference in 1953, that term, okay? We have been using some form of AI pretty much since then. Now, up till now, all right, most of what we have used is what's called extractive AI. Google is a really good example of extractive AI. You have a massive database. You ask Google, for, you ask Google a question, okay? And Google goes through this huge database of everything online, and gives you back answers and says, you know, you know, what would, uh, who won the Battle of Gettysburg? Okay, and here you go. All right. The important thing to remember about generative AI is that it essentially uses all that stuff that Google was able to compile and now can start making guesses about how it can be used. Okay. The way I like to think about it is like a term paper. I'm sorry to give you guys flashbacks to high school, but you remember when you did a term paper, okay? You were assigned a topic, maybe the Battle of Gettysburg, something along those lines. So you went to the library and you took out a lot of books and you wrote a lot, read a lot about a bunch of stuff. Okay, that was the extractive AI. That was you pulling all that information. Then you decided to put it all together, okay? And you started to write papers based on that. You made guesses, you created, okay? That is essentially generative AI, all right? Now we're at that, this spot, all right? Now, the reason it's become so hot so late, uh, lately is that there is a company called OpenAI. It was founded in 2015, okay? They put out their first iteration of their generative AI machine, GPT-1, okay, in 2018. All right, it used 117 million parameters of the things it was trying to do, to try to learn, okay? 2000, by 2023, they released GPT-4, chat GPT, the thing that the public can use for free. That was March of 2023. It uses 1.7 trillion parameters, all right? But importantly, the, the version that the public can use, the database was cut off in September of 2021, okay? That's going to be very important in just a minute, so remember that, okay? So now you're looking at the copyright and generative AI and you say, well, how good is it? Well, that right there was written by ChatGPT. I put in the red thing, it gave all the rest of it. Okay, now I was very careful to go back and read that okay, to make sure that it wasn't saying anything wrong. That is another thing we're gonna to have to remember because we're gonna be getting to that in just a second, all right? Now, the important thing about this as it pertains to people using it, okay, is right now we're kind of in a uh, Wild West scenario with respect to copyright, all right? Use the, using the stuff that the generative AI pumps out, 
All right, so we're going to do a quick review of copyright. Generally speaking, a copyright exists when a creative, important word, creative work is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. All right, in other words, when someone creates something, all right, as long as it is up here, it cannot be copyrighted. But as soon as you type it into a piece of, onto a piece of paper, as soon as you paint it onto a canvas, as soon as you take a photograph of it, it now has a copyright. Now you can register a federal copyright to get a lot more protections, but the thing to remember is that as soon as that creative work is fixed, the copyright exists, okay? Now a copyright's owner's bundles of rights include the right to reproduce, make copies, to publicly display, you can put it out and let other people look at it, publicly perform, your local bar band playing Leonard Skinner or whatever, they have the right to perform it, all right? Distribute it, give more, more copies out, or prepare derivative works. What is a derivative work? I'll give you an example, okay? How many people have seen West Side Story or gone to the play or know the book? Okay, West Side Story. A lot of you probably know that West Side Story is essentially a modern version of Romeo and Juliet, okay? It's a derivative work of Romeo and Juliet. It uses the same plot. But because William Shakespeare has been dead for 500 years and Romeo and Juliet was published long, long ago, it is in the public domain. So the people that created West Side Story did not have to pay William Shakespeare or his estate for the use of that particular thing. That's going to be important in just a second, too. In a real estate context, I hate to bring this up, you guys might be familiar with this, if you've ever dealt with someone who took photos, a professional photographer who took photos of a listing, all right? Sometimes they will hire an attorney and pop back up, okay? And then they will sue somebody for reusing photos because as soon as they took that photo, the copyright existed, okay? Now, we cannot talk about copyright and generative AI without dealing with monkey selfies. I'm sorry, I know it sounds a little crazy, but believe it or not, this is a key, uh, key uh, consideration when we deal with copyright and generative AI, all right? Now, this is Naruto. He is a macaque monkey. I don't know where macaque monkeys come from. I think it's Africa, it may be Asia, I don't know, okay? But the situation here was that a wildlife photographer went out to wherever it is uh, Naruto lives, set up a bunch of cameras. He was observing these things. Well, Naruto, being an inquisitive fellow, grabbed a camera, stuck his face in it, and took a picture all by himself, okay? The photographer didn't take that picture. This is literally a monkey selfie, okay? <laughs> So, it's a great picture, right? It's a fantastic picture. It's, it's really good. So the photographer came back to the United States, right, and started publishing the photo, right? Publication rights. We talked about those just a minute ago. You know, National Geographic, whatever, won awards and all that kind of stuff and got money, which caught the attention of PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals who thought it's not fair that the monkey's not getting the money for his selfie. <laughs> okay, so, he, so PETA sued the, the photographer to try to recover all of the royalties based on that photograph, okay? Now, eventually it made its way to the Ninth Circuit, which is the circuit on the West Coast, okay? The Ninth Circuit went so far as to say, unfortunately, Naruto does not have standing under the copyright laws, okay? So Naruto can't sue and recover money. And PETA, because you are not the owner of Naruto or whatever, you can't sue on his behalf. So unfortunately, this case has to be dismissed, all right? But then who owns the copyright? Well, the Ninth Circuit didn't go that far. They didn't say, someone owns the copyright, they essentially said the only party who could sue is a monkey, and since monkeys aren't covered under the Copyright Act, they can't sue, okay? So if no one owns the copyright, same thing happens that happened with Romeo and Juliet. It passes into the public domain. Anyone can use it. So why did I have that picture of Naruto up there? Because I didn't have to pay to use it. <laughs> All right? So, believe it or not, this is going to come back. 
All right, now, what does this have to do with real estate? Some of you folks already know about this. You've already seen things like this. You know how this stuff works, all right? After OpenAI started up, okay, websites started proliferating all over the place. They create, they, they allow you to use this AI, this generative AI. GP, Chat GPT is the one you've probably heard the most of, but DAL E2, Night Cafe, Deep AI, which is what I think I use to make these photos. All right, those are more, more work with photographs, artwork, things along those lines. Fodor is another one, okay? You guys may or may not be familiar with this. In case you weren't aware, I'm sure most of you are, but in case you weren't aware, I uh, went into Deep AI on that first photograph I put in Darth Vader on a bicycle, all right? That's what it spit out. That photograph has never existed anywhere. It did not take pieces of another photograph, or at least it's not supposed to, all right, and make that photograph. It was not Photoshopped. That was created wholesale by Deep, by, uh, Deep AI. The next one is flying fish over, uh, flying over the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Same thing. So these things do not, uh, do not exist. Now, are you beginning to see, if you didn't already see this, the kind of applications you could apply to real estate, in a real estate context? All right, how can Florida real estate agents use generative AI? Again, pretty easy, pretty easy question. Virtual property tours, right? They can, you could create something along those lines where you have something we were discussing at lunch. You show something to a buyer, uh, buyer says, I really like the house, but you know, I wasn't sold on the color of the walls and I'm not sure how my furniture will work, work, look, look in there. Guess what? You slap that stuff into a generative AI program. The next thing you know, you can do a virtual tour of that same property with their uh, artwork, their furniture, done to their specifications, and all of a sudden you just made a sale. All right, automated listing descriptions. This is probably where you've seen it mostly. I know Stellar MLS is using this already. They've already, they've already plugged AI into some of uh, the things that generate their listing descriptions. Um, I've talked to some members who think that they have started to notice the things that, you know, the telltale uh, signs that AI, uh, AI is being used to generate these things. Uh, predictive analytics, okay. Uh, Algorithms can bat, an, analyze vast amounts of historical real estate data. Remember, 1.7 trillion parameters. So if you want to know what a piece of property is worth, you could go back to the point where the Spanish owned Florida and find out everything about that piece of property and all the property around it and everything like that. So it might make your, uh, your CMAs and your, and your BPOs a lot easier to do. Uh, personalized property recommendations. This could be something to use with, uh, with a particular buyer. They put in what they're looking for. You don't have to go after, look at all of these different listings. The AI can comb them for, for, the, for you. Uh, market analysis and research, kind of the stuff we've heard earlier today. I know that some, uh, uh, I can't speak for, for Brad, but I know that some ec economists are beginning to use this kind of stuff. Um, automated, automated image enhancement, that's what I talked about earlier, where you can fix a photograph. You don't have to learn how to do Photoshop. The AI already knows all that kind of stuff. Now, remember that while generative AI can be a valuable tool, it should not replace the expertise and personalized service provided by real estate agents. It is essential to use AI as a supportive tool alongside human judgment and interaction to provide the best experience for clients. And you wanna hear something funny? These two pages, also generated by ChatGPT, including the disclaimer at the end. So ChatGPT is even saying, I'm doing the best I can, just make sure you look up after me, do, you know, check my work, if you don't mind. <laughs> but very, very important that you do that, very important. And it's getting more important by the day. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Okay, this is just basically my too long, didn't read uh, version of what you just saw. Generate listing descriptions, change color of paint type of floors, add or remove walls, furniture, fences, pools, etc. Can create houses or rooms that do not exist. Um, I, I understand that some builders are using this now, right? They can, where basically they take a picture of a piece of land and they say, what kind of house you want on there, all right? We've got a whole bunch of them. You tell me what it is, We'll put it on there. 
right? And they can just, they can, they can slap up anything you want, all right? Um, this right here, this is very old. Uh, again, this, this popped up on Zillow probably around March or so. Um, this was a, uh, according to the person who did the screen grab, this is a generative AI listing, okay? Um, now, you'll notice there's interesting things there, right? Uh, let me see, spacious living room, large family room, etc. cetera. All right, now we know from some of our recent, uh, uh, recent cases and stuff like that, that some of the terminology that has been used in listings forever, okay, is now perceived by some to be problematic, all right? Now, the AI is going to go back and comb all the stuff that exists. You know, the fact that master bedroom or walking distance to the beach may have become problematic in the last few years, okay, it's not going to pick up on that. All right, so again, that's why I say it's very important that you proofread anything that goes through. It can make, you know, the drudgery of creating a listing description so much easier, but at the same time, you have to make sure that anything that you particularly have issues with, that you fix it, all right? Uh, Tudor house with two chimneys, what I was talking about earlier. If you are a builder, you can just create that. Again, that house does not exist anywhere on earth. That was created by me using Deep AI. Okay. Same thing here. Formal dining room with light blue walls. Now, you'll notice that the Tudor house with two chimneys looks a little wonky, right? There's some strange things up there and all that kind of stuff. Um, doesn't look perfect, right? But the formal dining room with light blue walls, that looks a lot better. Again, these were created in January. Just think how good they are now if I were to do this again. And maybe that's what I'll do for the next time I do this talk. I'll show all the changes and how much better this stuff is getting very, very quickly. All right, so we talked about the monkey selfie earlier, but it creates a whole new set of questions. Who owns the copyright? Who is the creator? Is the AI like Naruto the monkey, right? The Copyright Act doesn't say anything about, uh, about computers creating things, okay? So luckily, we're beginning to get some clarity. When I first posed these questions, I didn't. But um, by the way, monkey with a camera, another thing I made up. That's, that's also <laughs> AI generated. Okay. So, those of you who are familiar with the copyright law may be asking yourself at this point, what about a work for hire? It's a concept under copyright law. Copyrighted work created by an employer. employer uh, empl or an employer employs the artist, the artist creates the stuff, but because of the way work for hire is set up, the uh, employer owns the copyright. Here's some examples. Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse was created by Walt Disney and a guy named Ub Iwerks, but they were working for the Walt Disney Company at the time, so the Walt Disney Company owns Mickey Mouse. Spider-Man, created by Steve Ditko and Stan Lee for Marvel Comics, all right? But Marvel Comics owns the copyright, right? Barbie, created in 1953 for Mattel, Mattel Toys, all right? Barbie is owned by Mattel, not by the person who created Barbie. So you're asking yourself, well, I told the AI what to do. I'm, in, in effect, the AI's employer, so shouldn't I be considered to be the employer for a work for hire? Well, funny you should ask that. Here we go. We've got, this is from earlier this year, I think March or April. Uh, the name of this, uh, um, the name of this painting is A Recent Entrance to Paradise. I did not create this one. This is not my work. But a gentleman named Thaler created the AI, com the AI system called Creativity Machine. He programmed it, okay? So he decided what the, how Creativity Machine worked. He went to the uh, copyright office and tried to copyright that painting, okay, as a work for hire, claiming that the AI was his employee and that he, in fact, was the employer. But the copyright artist said 
or copyright office said no, all right? Because, and believe it or not, they cited the monkey selfie case saying that AI is like a monkey. They don't have standing to sue and they can't create things, okay? At least not under the Copyright Act. Now, the, the uh, person who was claiming the copyright tried to change a bunch of stuff during the course of the case and said, well, what if I put in a little bit more effort here? And what if I gave it two more instructions there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the copyright office or the court did eventually say, okay, this is all brand new. We don't know about any of this stuff right now. And we could see Congress in the future doing something similar to a work for hire, but they haven't done that yet. Okay, we could also say that if an AI has a certain amount of creativity, that that could be copyrightable, but we don't have that yet. So as of right now, today, okay, anything created by AI, according to this case, is in the public domain, just like the monkey selfie is. Okay, good and bad. Good means you can use it. Bad, mean, bad means if you created it, you can't protect it. Okay. All right, another wrinkle. Remember when I told you at the beginning that the original GPT-1, right, used 117 million parameters. Well, what they did was they used books to help it learn. They fed the text of the books into GPT-1 and then said, spit us out stuff that sounds like these particular books and help, use that to help it learn, okay? So, I, I chose, in this particular thing, I said, give me a cyberpunk version of the Mona Lisa and Starry Night by Van Gogh. All right, now why did I use those? Because the Mona Lisa and the Starry Night by Van Gogh are in the public domain. So even if it turns out that there's, the AI does have some sort of copyright ability, at least they can't get me for using something that was already copyrighted, all right? So you can imagine that some of these artists saying you did not have the right to create derivative works using our work, all right, are saying, hey, we want, we want some, uh, um, uh, we want some compensation, all right? So this was the case I pulled from earlier this month, uh, Silverman versus OpenAI, comedian Sarah, Sarah Silverman, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that, with her. She does the voice of Vanilla P. Von Schweetz in Wreck-It Ralph. Um, she's also been around as a stand-up comedian for a very, very long time. She and some other authors filed a class action against OpenAI and ChatGPT for exactly what I was just talking about. You see that last one, I said a lawsuit is one of many being filed by authors. On Friday, George R.R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones, and John Grisham, the author of all those legal thrillers like The Firm and The Pelican Brief, filed another class action saying the same thing. We have no idea how these are gonna come out. Google has already defended cases similar to this with respect to their extractive AI, okay? And they've won those, so they're hoping to win on the same grounds. Like, we're not the ones that are actually violating the copyright, we're just enabling our computer program to do it. So, anyway, yeah. Okay, so what can you do now? Should you use these services? Well, you're already using them. All right, and you may not know it, you may. I think rather than using an actual ChatGPT OpenAI, you're going to see these increasingly integrated into things that you already use. Uh, Amazon gave a demonstration last week of Alexa using a generative AI to actually have conversations with people, okay? Microsoft's version of their generative AI is being integrated with their search engine Bing. So instead of asking Bing, you know, give me everything you know about the Battle of Gettysburg, you ask it, hey, what do you know about the Civil War? And then you have a conversation with it and you can limit it that way, okay? But until we get all of this stuff with copyrights uh, taken care of, then I recommend that you revert, if you do use one of these websites, review the terms of service, carefully to make sure that you are not granting the sole copyright to the AI website, okay? So in other words, don't let them have it, okay? Or if you are going to be using something, a, a photo that's not yours, um, at least ensure you have a license to use the photo or text. Uh, another development just a couple of days ago, Getty Images. You guys aware of Getty Images? They're a, 
they're a clearinghouse for stock photos that are used largely by newspapers and things along those lines. Getty has now their own generative AI tool that you can use from them that uses their database of photos. So you don't have to worry about the whole licensing issue because they already have a license to use the photos. So if you create, you know, something that's, you know, a cross between, I don't know, Taylor Swift and Brad and, uh, uh, and uh, right, use your imagination. Anyway, um, you do that. they've already got the license to use that. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Fair use. There's a concept in, uh, there's a concept in um, copyright called fair use. Sometimes you can use copyrighted stuff for things like parodies, political speech, educational. Eh? Um, and so, uh, but that's very limited in commercial context. So be very, very careful. Also, very important to you guys. If you do this stuff where you're manipulating photos of properties, all right, for whatever reason, if you're doing it in your listing, make sure you have a disclaimer at the bottom that, that says this photograph was manipulated using AI or whatever, okay? Code of ethics, article 12, true and accurate picture in your listings, all right? It's okay to do it, just make sure that those people, that anybody looking at it knows that you may have changed the color of something or erased a pool or added a fence or something along those lines, okay? All right, when you're using a text website like ChatGPT, confidentiality is not guaranteed just letting you know a little bit of something we had a, a change in the law in florida recently that made it much harder to sue insurance companies so the day before that went into effect personal injury law firms filed tens if not hundreds of thousands of cases one small firm used chat gpt to draft the lawsuits they gave ChatGPT information about their clients, social security numbers, birth dates, et cetera. None of that is guaranteed to be confidential. So when you're using these kind of things, if you don't know how they're being used, okay, stick to publicly available information, okay? Number of bedrooms, that kind of stuff. Um, conservatively, do not share non-public information. Always review the text that AI programs create. Something we're seeing more, more and more often now is what's called hallucinations. The way it's been described to me is that AI programs just want to please you. They want to make you happy. They want to do what you are asking them to do. So if they don't know something and they can't find something specific, they'll make it up. Okay? So... This happened recently again in another legal case where a law firm used ChatGPT to create a legal brief. ChatGPT cited all of these cases, and when the other side looked at them, it turned out none of them existed. <laughs> so the court, needless to say, was very, very upset and basically immediately had an administrative rule that said, you know, you cannot use generative AI to create your briefs. You just are not allowed to do it. Okay, another interesting thing. And this, I'll close on this one, okay? When they were developing one of their AI programs, okay, I believe it was Microsoft, created a little chat bot, okay? And they wanted to have it talk to people so it could learn and get better and more natural, all right? It was supposed to be a young woman. So people started asking it all kinds of questions and stuff like that, what's your favorite color? Um, who's your favorite uh, recording artist? You know, what's your favorite flower? Whatever. And the, the chat bot would have a really nice afternoon talking to these people. But as it got more and more information, as it clawed in more and more parameters, it found some of the darker corners of the internet. And eventually started saying some really racist, sexist, awful things. That was after about two days. That's how fast things went off the rails with that. Okay. So talking about hallucinations, talking about clawing in stuff that's, you know, not relevant at best or really awful at worst, make sure when you're using these kind of things, always, always, always go back and proofread, make sure it says what you want it to say and that it's not saying anything awful. Do not be a law firm that gets disbarred. Okay.
that is it. And I believe uh, we have a more accurate um, or a, 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 we have a broader uh, presentation if you send an email to that uh, email there or if you like this one, you can just get it from the local folks. Okay, thank you.